uh, this seminar will present the outcome of the 10th anniversary meeting of Innovation for Crew Earth Forum, or ICEF, hosted by Menti and Medo. Uh, in this seminar, first, uh, Menti and Medo will introduce the policies, innovations, and technologies for net zero emissions uh, discussed at ICEF and so on. Afterwards, the first uh, version of the ICEF roadmap, uh, artificial uh, intelligence for climate change mitigation, will be presented, then followed by a panel discussion. Then, I'd like to start the seminar. Uh, first, we'll have an opening remarks by Mr. Kobayashi uh, Izuru, uh, Deputy Director General for Technology and Environment at the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. Mr. Kobayashi, please. Uh, Well, um, first, thank you very much for uh, coming to this uh, launching event of the ICEF roadmap, the um, AI for the uh, climate change mitigation. And the, um, first, I would like to touch on the uh, ICEF. Well, I ICEF is the Shakyu Fork of Mars Cola, which was started uh, 10 years ago. And the, uh, when the, at that time, the world was starting to negotiate the Paris Agreement. And since then, ICF has been operated as a platform for the leaders and experts of industries, academia, and private public sectors to discuss about innovations on green technology. Uh, ICF has organized annual meetings in Tokyo and over 1,000 experts and leaders of industries, academia and government uh, all over the world attended uh, each of the annual meeting and discussed the future and ongoing technology innovation. Uh, Mr. David Sandro, uh, who was the secretary of DOE, he has been a very key member of the uh, steering committee of ICEF uh, since its inception. And he and his team have been contributing the ICEF Innovation Roadmap project since 2015 and uh, uh, selecting relevant technologies and uh, uh, producing reports annually. Uh, this year, uh, they chose the uh, artificial intelligence for mitigation technology. Uh, I don't have to explain the uh, uh, relevance and timeliness of uh, this direction and I'm very much looking forward to the presentation on this very important technology and uh, its potential contribution to the uh, global decarbonization. Uh, I just would like to uh, briefly touch on the uh, Tokyo GX week. Um, GX is the acronym of the uh, Green Transformation. Um, the Japanese government Course in a multiple climate change related events, uh, including ICEF uh, annual meetings, and also the uh, Hydrogen Ministerial, Asia Green Growth Partnership Ministerial, Ammonia International uh, Conference, etc., uh, and also the uh, GX Summit, uh, uh, basically the Prime Minister signatories this uh, annual event, uh, in the same week of uh, September. And uh, we will conduct that in the next years as well, as well. So therefore, if you schedule a visit to Tokyo next year, uh, please consider visiting the, uh, that year, during that period, so that you can cover the uh, very important uh, international events related to the climate change, which will take place in Tokyo. And uh, uh, I stop my uh, statement here, and uh, uh, thank you again for organizing and doing this very important. Then I'd like to move to the next agenda. Uh, the next 
will have a special speech by Dr. Noel Bakhtian, uh, Director of Tech uh, Acceleration at the Bezos Earth Fund. Yes. First and foremost, I would like to thank the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry of Japan and the New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization of Japan for hosting this event and for the honor of being a speaker. My name is Noel Bakhtian and it is a privilege to be here at this, at this launch event representing the Bezos Earth Fund. The Basils Earth Fund is a $10 billion commitment to nature and climate to focus on very just solutions to be spent in this decisive decade aligned with the UN Sustainability Goals deadline. This is the largest philanthropic climate commitment ever made. We all know that solving for climate change in nature requires a focus on spurring innovation and progress, including in new technological advances. As Director of Tech Acceleration at the Basel's Earth Fund, I'm looking at three things. The first, for each climate and nature challenge that our small but mighty team is diving in on, for example, food systems of the future, the power grid, the transportation sector, just to name a few, we're thinking about where we can catalyze change to accelerate technology solutions for faster impact, for higher impact. This, of course, entails a focus on the science and the data, but beyond that, we do know that technology solutions depend on an entire ecosystem of players and mechanisms. So we're also thinking about finance and markets. We're also thinking about policy and regulation. We're also thinking about socio-behavioral uh, aspects and community engagement. Another lens for acceleration, more in economic terms, is thinking about supply push mechanisms. For example, funding research, basic and applied, and also demand pull or market shaping mechanisms, such as prizes and challenges, uh, buyers clubs, government procure procurement, and advanced market commitments. And we're exploring some specific areas where we can catalyze using these mechanisms. Secondly, we recognize, all of us, that current solutions that are already in the pipeline won't get us all the way to our 2050 goals, which means we are going to need some new technology. But the idea to market to scale timeline is currently a competing process, so we're looking to disrupt this, to accelerate this. Many of you will be quite familiar with the technology readiness level scale from 1 to 9. We're also illuminating the need to strategize a more beyond that going from ideas to market to scale, which we know as humans we have not done very many times. So thinking about scale to gigawatts deployed, scale to gigatons mitigated. And thirdly, I'm uh, thinking about something I call tech X. So advancing and applying the X factor to climate and nature as acceleration tools for climate. For, in for instance, we've seen incredible progress in technologies such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, blockchain, quantum, robotics, nanotech. And the artificial intelligence part is very relevant for today. We believe at the Earth Fund that trustworthy and responsible artificial intelligence will accelerate and make possible solutions to reduce climate change, protect nature, and empower communities also. We at the Earth Fund have an AI initiative led by Amin Ra Mashariki, our Director of Data Strategies, who I'm proud to support, focused on the AI superpowers of speed, scale, precision, accuracy, and efficiency. So what we're doing is we're building trusted partnerships and working strongly on collaboration and community, which will be key to ensuring that we identify those strong AI solutions uh, in order to help solve major challenges, grand challenges in climate and nature. At the moment, we're undergoing a major landscape assessment to ide identify where we can complement and, and lead on impacts that we collectively need to make globally on AI for, for nature and climate. We understand that it is the, the frontline organizations that are already applying impactful solutions to many of these climate and nature challenges, and we're focusing on grants that can help enable those organizations to have 5x, 10x, maybe even 100x the impact that they can have without artificial intelligence. 
So please look to announcements that we will be making soon on how solvers can jump in uh, and, and join our ecosystem on 5Xing, 10Xing, and 100Xing, the climate solution space for AI. In the lead up to this, we ran a workshop about six weeks ago in San Francisco, which was very much focused on de -siloing. We wanted to bring together the AI practitioners and biggest thinkers with nature and climate specialists. And we also intentionally worked to bring together the research community, with the entrepreneurial community, with the decision-making community. And what came out of this very hands-on workshop was over 50 climate challenges, over 50 nature challenges, and illuminating about 40 AI superpowers. And then doing the hard work of matchmaking those two sets and coming up with 60 opportunity spaces at the nexus of climate and nature challenges and AI capabilities. Our report is coming out in a few weeks, so stay tuned. And during the panel, I look forward to sharing uh, some of those results. So to close, at the Basils Earth Fund, we know that AI is a necessary force multiplier to ensure that we as a planet learn, adapt, and change quickly in this decisive decade. I'll end with a quote that I created with the support of AI, with the support of ChatGPT. Imagine a future where the synergy between AI and human ingenuity amplifies the scale of solutions in a way that empowers people to reimagine and reshape the very foundations of our relationship with nature and climate, opening the doors to new horizons and possibilities. Which also tells me that ChatGPT likes we're not centers. <laughs> so congratulations on the launch of this report and thank you for the honor of being here at the Thank you. Um, then uh, the next agenda is a uh, presentation by Mr. Yoshioka Masatsugu, uh, Executive Director at NEDO. Mr. Yoshioka. Thank you very much. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about three things. Uh, firstly, uh, I really want to do the uh, mission and the green innovation fund projects implemented by NETO. Finally, I will explain the innovation for Tugas Forum or ICE. Firstly, I would like to give you an interview, overview of what NETO is and what its missions are following the two oil crisis of the 1970s. It was established in 1980 to promote the development and the introduction of new energy technologies. Since then, NEDO has become one of the largest public funding agencies in Japan, and it works with the government to implement economic and industrial policies. In this capacity, NEDO undertakes technology development and demonstration activity to carry out is two basic missions of addressing energy and the global environmental problems and energy industry technology. The budget for this year is one billion US dollars. In addition to this, the fund for the second time 45 billion US dollars. Currently there are about 100 projects underway, most largely small about 1,000 companies and 100 universities and public research institutes are uh, participating in those projects. In action, since the early 1990s, NEDO has conducted more than 100 international projects and is currently conducting more than 30 studies and demonstration projects globally. As a lower National Agency that supports Japan's energy and environmental policy. NEDO has been developing and demonstrating innovative technologies for clean energy and industrial technology. It also plays a role here in promoting the practical application of projects research and contributing even further to the resolution of social issues. In recent years, with the aim of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050, NEDO has been set three essential areas to focus on our projects. A circular economy, a bio, 
economy and a sustainable energy. Also, VX was newly added as a fundamental asset. Also, to support the integration, integral promotion of the three social system this year. Based on the latest social and technology trends, Tena has released the comprehensive guideline for technological development of 2023, which provides an overview and evaluation of technologies related to three social systems and the PEX that support them, which have become increasingly important. As I said earlier, one of the key missions is addressing energy and global environmental problems. Here are some examples of energy projects achieved, such as we have been developing next generation energy, hydrogen, offshore wind power, superconducting cable, and carbon capture and storage technology. Next, I would like to introduce the Innovation Fund project. In October 2020, the Japanese government declared that it would aim to realize the carbon neutral and decarbonized society in 2050. In this course, in December 2020, the Ministry of Energy, in collaboration with the relevant ministers and agencies, formulated the Green Growth Strategy for Carbon Neutral. Based on this, this committee established the fund. 18 million US dollars as part of the medals and the start of the 10-year green innovation fund project in March 2021. NATO is currently using this fund for 20 decarbonization related projects. There are currently 20 GI fund projects being promoted among us. Among them, I would like to talk about hydrogen, hydrogen projects. Hydrogen not only directly contributes to the decarbonization of the electric power sector, but also maximizes the potential of zero emission power sources, such as renewable energy, by converting excess electricity into hydrogen for storage and utilization. In order to promote the social implementation of hydrogen, it is important to establish a hydrogen supply network and supply chain. This is a project for transporting liquid by hydrogen between Australia and Japan by sea, which was successfully demonstrated last year. The ship called the Sea Salt Frontier. Uh, loaded to liquefy the hydrogen produced from Colombia, Victoria, Australia, and returned to Japan in February 2022. The project is the first in the world to establish large scale marine transportation technology for liquefied hydrogen, amounting to tens of thousands of tons per year. It attracts global attention as a demonstration of an integrated international liquefied hydrogen supply chain from upstream to downstream. <laughs> Next step in hydrogen supply chain project is commercialization. NEDO aims to establish overseas transport and technology for liquefied hydrogen by 2030. In addition, NEDO will contribute to the establishment of the international liquefied hydrogen supply chain on a commercial scale toward Realizing carbon neutral by 2050 in cooperation with current consumers and local municipalities to implement the hydrogen power generation demonstration. Then we continue to further promote international cooperation to establish a strong supply chain for hydrogen. Finally, I'd like to talk about the ICEP. ICEP is an international conference to promote innovation in the field of energy and the environment to solve climate change. It has been organized by the Japanese government, Ministry Meki and Navy since 2014. It has been organized by Meki and Navy since 2014. I think the place where high resolution makers come together to accelerate concrete implementation, not just interpret just for discussion. This year's ISEP was held as a part of the Tokyo Green Transformation Week. The Japanese government's climate awareness campaign around the 
1,700 people from 1,700 people in the region, and there were 21 sessions to discuss innovation and climate change. ICEP has two outcomes. One is the ICEP stage from the steering point and standardized ICEP road. Twelve ICEP roadmaps have been released so far, and each of them identifies key innovative technologies contributing to the transition to free energy. Today, we are pleased to present the latest road. After my presentation, Mr. David Sandro of ICEP Steering Committee will present the ICEP 2023 roadmap of artificial intelligence and climate change. Thank you very much, Mr. Sandro, for your great work on this roadmap. I promise all of you never to come to the climate change program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Yoshioka. Uh, okay, so we'll move to the next agenda. Uh, next, uh, we'll have a program of launch of the ISEP roadmap by Mr. David Sandro, uh, the ISEP steering committee member, and also inaugural fellow, a Center of Glo Global Energy Policy from the University. Thank you very much. It's very good to be here. Thank you to NATO. Thank you to Medi, uh, to Kabiachi san to Yoshioki san Thank you so much for your support for our project. We appreciate it enormously. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here today to release our 2023 ICEP roadmap, which is already been discussed, is on the topic of artificial intelligence for climate change mitigation. We have a tremendous team of co-authors that worked on this project, and you can see their names here. And I'm thrilled that I'm joined by two of them here today. Uh, Julio Friedman, who has been an extraordinary member of ICEP roadmap teams for many, many years, uh, and is a, a good friend, and Antoine Hell who is, uh, as well, and um, I should say, Dr. Friedman is the chief scientist at um, Carbon Direct, uh, and Antoine Hal is um, co-founder of Kairos, uh, and a scholar at the Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy, where I work as well. And gentlemen, would you like to join me to uh, present this roadmap? So the question we looked at in this roadmap is how can artificial intelligence help reduce emissions of greenhouse gases? Two questions we actually didn't look at, which are they're important, but we I would spoke for this report, is how can AI help adapt to climate change? And on balance, will AI help uh, hinder or uh, help prohibit the fight against climate change? We were really want to create a tool for anybody who wants to use AI to fight climate change to look at opportunities and good ways uh, and barriers and, and tools for doing this. Um, here's our outline. Uh, this is the table of contents. Um, uh, as you can see, it starts with introductions to both uh, artificial intelligence and climate change. The report is written for both experts and non-experts. Um, then we look at six high potential opportunities. We have gas emissions monitoring, power grids, manufacturing, materials innovation, food systems, road transport. And then we look at cross-cutting issues. And we're going to talk about some of these in the next 15 or 20 minutes. The first high potential opportunity we looked at, which in my opinion is a huge, extraordinary opportunity for greenhouse gas emissions monitoring, and this is something that I don't want to help work on. He wrote this chapter, and he's going to talk about it today. And on the floor here. Uh, maybe from there, he's here. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I'm very honored and it was a pleasure to work with. Uh, David and others on this, uh, on this report. So uh, measuring emissions uh, clearly is, is fundamental for climate action. Uh, we cannot uh, get to our climate objectives if we don't understand emissions, if we can't measure them, if we can't assess the impact of policies and uh, uh, identify priorities and low-hanging uh, uh, fruits. Uh, and 
I think recently we have very limited uh, visibility on, uh, on, on uh, emissions. Uh, this is changing. Uh, there's a revolution in, in uh, emissions data, and this is essentially uh, driven by artificial intelligence, machine learning, as well as remote sensing and, and satellite images. So if I take an example, for example, methane emissions. We, we, at the time of the Paris Agreement in uh, 2015, uh, we understood that methane was uh, the second largest driver of climate change. I contributed one third of global warming and was on track to contribute even more in the short term. But there was almost no targets, no methane reduction targets set at, uh, at the Paris Agreement because we just didn't know where methane was coming from. We could measure concentration, not really emissions. This has changed dramatically. Uh, and we now uh, have been able to harness the power of satellite imaging with AI, processing tens of terabytes every day to track uh, the sources of, of methane and to track also basin level emissions and, and country level emissions. So it's a dramatic revolution which has enabled policy in a major way. It's been uh, uh, here uh, at uh, COP28, uh, a slew of announcements about methane abatement, methane targets, methane initiatives. They're all really enabled and empowered by the progress we've made using AI to process data from satellites. So satellites is the hardware, uh, obviously essential to provide data, uh, but satellites would be useless without the AI capacity to process information from them. Uh, to process information from single uh, sensors, like uh, Procomi, uh, Sentinel 5P of the European Space Agency, but also to extract information from sensors that may not have been designed initially to track methane uh, and to hybrid to, to combine fused data from multiple sensors and also to fuse data from satellite sensors as well as in situ sensors locally and other types of, uh, of sources. Another example I would take uh, is carbon emission. So uh, carbon is very different because before we had visibility on methane emissions with satellites and AI, we had really very poor uh, guesses about what, uh, what uh, we were emitting and most people, most companies and countries were relying on, on emission factors, which are still prescribed by the UNFCCC. Uh, but we have been shown to dramatically understate the actual level of emissions. With carbon, it's different. Carbon is a byproduct of consumption. It's not an accident of, of uh, energy creation, production. Uh, so emission factors are fairly reliable, but information based on that tends to be very delayed, very lagged, very aggregated, uh, very uh, inadequate to drive uh, climate policy and climate action. So with, uh, with satellites and AI, we want directly to the track carbon emissions from, from space uh, because of the lack of contrast between the emissions and the background, so much carbon in the atmosphere, that's going to change with the new generation of satellites. But we are today able to track indirectly carbon emissions by measuring the activity of carbon uh, intensive industries like cement and, and steel, uh, and also tracking uh, transportation and other sources of carbon emissions. So we have a much better visibility, very granular, very comprehensive, very timely, near real time. And this is laying the foundation for a much more efficient carbon market than we have today. And getting a more efficient carbon market could be key to drive the transition and the decarbonization. The last example I will take is forestry. Uh, today there's a dramatic uh, crisis of uh, confidence in the, in the market for uh, voluntary carbon offsets based on nature based solutions. Uh, there's been a series of scandals uh, which have been reported in the, in the media, uh, all due to a lack of transparency. There's a market for uh, carbon offsets based on forestry, but that the recently the uh, inspection uh, methods were really antiquated based on sending people on the ground with, uh, with the shotguns and, and, and uh, tape measures to measure a couple of uh, tree trunks and extrapolate from that and come back five years later. So that was... Uh, uh, the door open to all kinds of reviews and fraud. Uh, now with satellite imaging, we can measure track forestry at 10 meter resolution or less. We can measure the surface of forestry and also the height, the canopy, the diversity of species, the density of foliage, and measure very precisely the amount of carbon embedded in forestry uh, fossils. Uh, so this is, uh, again, uh, about to change dramatically the carbon market, uh, 
laying the foundation of uh, rebuilding the trust in, uh, in, in carbon offsets, which are essential uh, to reach our climate targets, uh, and uh, I think changing the world. So there are some hurdles, some challenges uh, about uh, using AI and satellite for, for carbon emissions, but I think we could go back to that in the, in the latter part of the discussion. Uh, thank you, Antoine. And if anyone is interested in more information on this topic, I urge you to download our report. The chapter which Antoine and his co-authors wrote has got extraordinary detail on this topic. We also did a chapter on the power sector, and the power sector is an area where it is hard to imagine decarbonizing without artificial intelligence tools. Every single part of the power sector uh, can benefit from artificial intelligence. We're already seeing renewable uh, generation with solar and wind. Uh, relying on artificial intelligence or predictive analytics and when the sun's going to shine and the wind is going to blow. Um, but the managing to be decarbonized, um, decentralized, is going to depend on massive amounts of information and information processing. Um, there are some real constraints here. Um, principal constraint, we found this throughout the roadmap um, in every area, is the lack of well-trained personnel. Um, and we just don't have the people with the expertise uh, to do this. And we also need to make sure that we have the right data um, as we use AI in the power system. Another issue we discussed in the roadmap and is important here is privacy issues because a lot of the data that we'll use uh, in AI in the power sector may be customer data that we need to make sure it's handled in a correct way. So there are a variety of issues but extraordinary opportunity and the clients that I spoke to about this topic says it simply will be impossible to manage a decentralized, decarbonized electric grid without machine learning tools. Another area that we look at is materials innovation, tremendous opportunities, and Dr. Friedman is going to talk about that. Thank you so much, David. Thank you again to NATO and many for having us here and to give us the opportunity to work on this really fun report. Um, if you read the literature today, a number that comes up over and over again is 10%. This is the guess in terms of how much efficiency gains you can get system-wide with AI. That number could be bigger, it could be smaller, but that's a number that comes up a lot. This pathway is a way to do much, much better than that. Materials innovation allows you to create things that do not exist, and using that jump the curve and not only get much more dramatic efficiencies, but begin to displace existing materials in the world. So, high performance materials are really essential to decarbonization. These materials range from catalysts to building materials, and everything in between. Historically, this was done like Santa's toy shop, one at a time. And people were, were just using an Edisonian approach where they would try a material and it would fail. They would try a material and fail until you got a material finally to succeed. That's done pretty well. That's how we have light bulbs among other things. Still, it has become now possible through not only great computational advances in computing power, but also in machine learning and AI to be able to discover materials that are hypothetical and based on that determine which are stable and based on that synthesize the ones that have the greatest promise and to rank them accordingly. This is no longer hypothetical. Just a week or two ago, uh, Google DeepMind announced that they had uh, uh, discovered 2.2 million hypothetical materials using these approaches. Based on that, they assessed that about 400,000 of them are stable and are now beginning to go through and figure out which of these have the most uh, promise. These will allow us to potentially displace steel, create new processes like photocatalysis, design novel reactors based on these materials, and so forth. Everything from solar perovskites to novel nuclear fuels can fall into this category. So uh, we are just beginning to understand the opportunity set here and how big it can be. If uh, this is going to take longer, the sort of things that Antoine was talking about or the sort of things that are David were talking about, those will enter the market more quickly, but these could have extraordinarily large impacts and provide profound abatement potential. With that, back to you, Dr. Sindel. Uh, thank you, Julio.
we wrote uh, chapters on three other topics, on, on the food system, on, on manufacturing, on road transport. We don't have time to get into them now, but please uh, read our roadmap if you'd like more information about each of those topics. Then, having looked at these six different areas, we looked at cross-cutting issues in this roadmap. And first, we looked at barriers. The question is, what's preventing us from using artificial intelligence tools for climate change mitigation? We identified five, you can see them on this slide. Data, people, computation, cost, and institutions. And of these, by far the most important are data and people. Artificial intelligence is a powerful tool if there is lots of data, it's standardized, and it can be accessed. And in some areas, uh, there are good data sets, but in other areas, there are not good data sets. And we're going to need systematic attention to developing good data sets if we're going to be able to use artificial intelligence for climate change mitigation. And the other critical barrier is the lack of trained people. And it, it's not just people who are programmers who can write code and develop the models. It's also people who understand the application of artificial intelligence and end users. Uh, and, and a variety of different skill sets in between. Um, we also looked at risks from artificial intelligence. It, this is a hugely important topic. Artificial intelligence has some very serious risks associated with it. And when you use artificial intelligence for climate change mitigation, those risks exist and they need to be managed. So one risk is bias. There have been famous discussion, for example, in, in this area of bias and hiring, with algorithms for, for hiring that were biased in favor of, of male applicants because male applicants have been the most successful in the past. That type of bias would absolutely exist in some applications. Okay, so very good. Um, uh, bias is a serious risk um, with in some areas in this in this field, for example, in power sector applications where we're relying on customer data. Uh, less of an issue, I think, in some of the materials innovation issues that Julio was talking about, but it needs uh, serious attention. The same with invasions of privacy. And the security and safety issues are very important. Um, we, we can't use artificial intelligence for real-time management of, of some operations until um, uh, understandability uh, interpretability of the models is improved beyond the, uh, where they are right now. Another risk which is getting a lot of attention is the increase in greenhouse gas emissions as a result of AI operations. And we did a deep dive in the literature on this, and, and we came up with the following conclusions. First, today, AI is not responsible for generating a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions globally. Probably the best study on this is a Nature paper that concluded that 0.1 to 0.2 percent of greenhouse gas emissions two years ago came from data centers, and they're roughly 20 the greenhouse gas emissions globally, and they're roughly 25 percent of that is attributable to artificial intelligence. So today, it's not a huge number. But in the future, it could absolutely increase because artificial intelligence uh, applications are going to increase exponentially. But the uncertainty is enormous um, because at the same time that artificial intelligence use is going to increase exponentially, the efficiency of AI hardware is going to increase dramatically. And the efficiency of the AI software and all the models is going to improve dramatically. And then um, the operators of hyper data centers and hyperscalers are the world's biggest purchasers of renewable energy. So even if artificial intelligence energy use increases dramatically, that doesn't mean that greenhouse gas emissions from AI will increase dramatically. So netting out all those factors, our conclusion was the range of uncertainty is enormous. Artificial emissions from AI could actually decrease in the years ahead, or they could increase significantly. So we need to pay attention from a policy standpoint to make sure that as AI increases dramatically, the greenhouse gas emissions don't increase as well. We looked at policies, um, both policies for AI broadly, and then, um, then looked specifically at what are policies that we can use to promote the use of AI for climate change mitigation, and then policies for managing risks. I think it's really important to say that policy is essential here. This AI is a remarkable innovation that's going to change a lot of things. Like but innovation does not necessarily mean low carbon emissions. We've seen plenty of innovations in the past 120 years that have been used to increase the 
definition of great thought gas with a decrease in emissions. So we need policy at the highest level that will make sure that we continue to ratchet down our emissions of greenhouse gases. And then we need some specifically that will focus on artificial intelligence and their use in this area. And we identified a number of policies that could be used for, um, for promoting the use of AI for climate change mitigation, launching skills development programs because that's such a critical barrier, funding the collection of climate-related data. Governments have a very important role in that area. Encouraging or requiring the standardization climate-related data. Standardization is a major issue in this area. Um, we recommend that every government ministry, indeed every organization that has a role in climate mitigation, create an AI office, um, and uh, or maybe as an advisor to the head of the organization on AI. Um, and then international initiatives such as the Nuclear Energy Ministerial Committee that is also and then, at the same time, it's going to be very important to manage the risks that, we, that I was speaking about and to do that with policy. And that means standards that require diverse representative data sets for AI models, legal frameworks holding it to be responsible and accountable, independent oversight boards can make a big difference for privacy, um, promoting R&D on energy efficient models, energy efficient um, hardware, and then tax incentives uh, can make a big difference here as well. So we have a whole suite of policy instead of what we recommend. Uh, we have uh, almost a dozen recommendations, and for with that, I'm going to turn it back over to William Friedman. Thank you, David. And again, I recommend all of you get the full report, take a look at the full set of findings and recommendations there. In the interest of time, we're down to the last three minutes here, and so we're just going to deal with these recommendations. First, the tools are so powerful and so useful, AI tools should be integrated into many, many aspects of climate change mitigation. It's just too valuable to ignore. Uh, this should be a priority in institutions that have a role in climate change mitigation. And none of this is too surprising. It is obvious to imagine this going into educational institutions and that they will begin to discuss and incorporate this into their curricula and their training and so forth. But as David said, government agencies, businesses, many different groups need to begin to get facility with this and build it into their core work. In that context, government should assist the development and the standardization of these data so that more and more AI can use them and have access and develop in a way that will mitigate climate change. All government agencies that have a role in climate change really do need an AI office or an AI advisor in the senior. That's uh, not negotiable. It simply is required to avoid bad outcomes as well as to achieve good outcomes. Next. Uh, because of the extraordinary value of AI applications in electricity decarbonization and incorporating more green electricity into grids, utilities should be incentivized to deploy it. Not just the utilities, but also those that make the software and market management software that they run. That, especially those with regulated returns for the investments in AI and tools. You want uh, utilities to do more of this, and so you want to put it into the rate base, not from shareholder money. Government should launch international platforms. This is a team sport. Many nations simply cannot do as much as they would like in this, so we should have greater international collaboration on this front. Um, because of the uncertainties that David mentioned around the greenhouse gas emissions from AI, government should make sure constantly to minimize the greenhouse gas emissions from these tools. As we scale the deployment, as more of it is used, we should keep track of this and seek to minimize the direct greenhouse gas emissions from AI operations. Uh, finally, avoiding unfair bias should really be a core principle of this. And that is true in terms of unfair bias on geography, on data bias, uh, on social bias, on economic bias, all of these things. Again, it is easy to fall into that trap, so you need to work deliberately to avoid it. Thank you. Terrific, and with that, I just want to once again thank Manny and Nito for their support of this work. This is, uh, uh, I think, our 12th roadmap as part of the um, uh, ICEF roadmap project. We've had others on low carbon ammonia, carbon mineralization, biomass carbon removal and storage, uh, a number of other topics. Please go to the ICEF website and take a look if you're interested in any of these topics. And, um, 
here just by way of advertisement some nice comments we've had from some famous and important people. Um, Ho Sun Lee, the head of the International Panel on Climate Change, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, says the roadmap for important research on a wide range of technologies. Uh, I think I'm most proud of what Vaclav Smil said. If anybody knows Vaclav Smil, he is a very harsh critic of many, uh, uh, of lots of analysis. And he actually said that what we're doing is more following. If Vaclav Smil says that, we hope he's right. Um, and then uh, Alyssa Park, a prominent uh, scholar in the United States, done the same. And we couldn't have done it without support from uh, Nito and many. So, so many thanks. Uh, and with that, we'll call this to a close. And I think we have a panel discussion coming up. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sandoval and uh, Dr. Griezmann and Mr. Stefan. Okay, so I'd like to go to the next, last agenda of this seminar. The panel discussion regarding uh, ISEP roadmap and innovation for net zero emission and so on. The participants of this panel are uh, Mr. Sandro and uh, Dr. Julio Friedman and Mr. Antoine again, and then uh, Dr. Bakhtian, please, and then uh, Mr. Laurent Roche, uh, Director, IRENA uh, Innovation and Technology Center, and Mr. Alexei Sakrazo, uh, Industrial Development Officer, the Digital Transformation and AI Strategy Division at UNIDO. So, yes, please start. Thank you again. Um, welcome, Ronald Resch, welcome. Uh, good to have both of you here. Uh, why don't we start from hearing uh, from the speakers who we haven't heard from yet. Um, and uh, uh, Roland Resch, you've already been introduced to the director of the Arena Innovation and Technology Center. Uh, but uh, please, um, uh, please tell us what you work on and why you're here on this panel. So is this working? Yes. yes. Oh, great to be here for this uh, International AIS Forum and thanks a lot for Meno and Meti for this invitation here. Indeed, the report and the work on the report is, is very welcome. I kind of have taken the time to go through the report, so I have a few comments on it and how this can be important for the work of the International Renewable Energy Agency. For the ones that are aware, who is the International Renewable Energy Agency? So we are a governmental agency with 169 member countries with the objective to accelerate the use of sustainable energy, so to accelerate the use of the of uh, renewable energies and we are basically the global energy transition agency and yeah I said so we welcome very much this report and let's say I have quite some comments on that. Uh, please, um, why don't we just first quickly hear from Alexei Yes, I, thank you so much for inviting you to this distinguished panel. Uh, I will present the division of uh, digital transformation and artificial intelligence strategies. Um, uh, what we deal with is implementation of frontier technologies, including the AI in industry, the manufacturing and productive sector in, in developing countries. Um, as per the mandate of UNIDO uh, to uh, provide you know, inclusive and sustainable industrial development. So we're trying to see how, uh, under which conditions, uh, in what context, we should implement uh, the upsetting of the technologies that we are working on, including the artificial intelligence, to increase the efficiency, 
uh, reduce emissions, pollution, uh, and provide for sustainability. Yes, I see F roadmap on an official intelligence for climate change. We can calculate ICF for the quality and comprehensiveness of the roadmap. It is excellent work and very timely. IRENA has been advocating for an increased use of digital technologies since more than six years already. Digitalization can be defined as converting data into value for power systems. It is crucial to optimize and management in a smart way more complex electricity systems and make decentralization and electrification a source of flexibility instead of a birth for power systems. So we see three concrete priority digital technologies to support the integration of renewables into electricity systems. This is the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence and also distributed ledger technologies like blockchains. In the Internet of Things, smart devices are able to gather data from each one of the appliances producing or consuming electricity. Those appliances become data sources. IoT collects and transmissions such data at the demand side level, but also to a system level. It allows to manage localized applications and optimizes the power system. Aggregating and making the data useful, not just to manage localized applications, uh, but to optimize the whole power system. Now flows of electrons are followed by flows of bytes managed by, by data spaces. The second technology to mention is artificial intelligence. The focus of ICEF's roadmap, as we can now have access to big amounts of data from all those of smart devices, we can now use the data to make fast and smart decisions in, in, in benefit of the system. This is the role of artificial intelligence. In our analysis, we have identified six concrete, concrete uh, artificial intelligence applications being pursued by actors in power systems, supporting the integration of renewables. From the generation side, better generation forecasts from the transmission and distribution segment, support of ONF of grid infrastructure from a demand side, and improved forecast of demand patterns and untap on demand side management. And at whole system level, there are projects focused on an optimized use of energy storage connected at different parts of the system. And finally, an emerging application to optimize market design and operations. And last but not least, the third technology to mention is blockchain, or broader distributed ledger technologies. As mentioned, data can be used to make decisions to optimize the system, but those decisions should result in transaction involving different parties, for example, charging my EV at certain time, the price, reducing my air condition demand, and being compensated for that. Those transactions can be automated by meeting certain defined criteria. They need to be implemented and securely recorded. All of this is also known as smart contracts and implemented via blockchains. Now I'd like to conclude by highlighting what we see from our discussions with experts as key factors to foster digitalization in energy. One is unlocking the benefits of digitalization for regulation, supporting a more dynamic regulation by having access to real-time data for decision-making, but also enhancing transparency and engagement with all the new actors in the Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind words of honor. Yes, the thoughts. Thank you so much for the report. So we studied it, we discussed it with our experts. Uh,
we totally support your vision of the transformational nature of AI, and what it can bring, uh, what future can it create. Uh, this vision uh, reflects what uh, we are trying to pursue right now with your network. We created the Unido Global Alliance for AI for Industry and Manufacturing. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you today to invite you to join us in, in discussions like these to see how we can use the transformative nature of AI uh, for good. So this is first. Uh, the second, the uh, approach that you take, collaborative approach, and the open platform uh, for discussion between academia, private sectors, and uh, public sector, governmental institutions, international organizations. Uh, this is something that uh, we would say is the keepers uh, in order to harness the potential. We cannot do it alone. But at the same time, uh, what we saw is uh, one of our in UNIDO uh, Global Alliance on AI um, emphasis is on bridging the gap between those that are advancing and those uh, that are not still there. And this gap can be interregional, nation to nation, and within this nation. And in some way, we can think. In this way, uh, we need to share, we need to be more open, and the technological, uh, international technology collaboration, sharing of the technologies, uh, will be the key here. Of course, what do you need for that? And uh, this is uh, excellent okay, and very important. You need the people who know how to do that, the qualified personnel, and you need the data which should be available, that should be accessible. For some countries, as you said, this is the bias that you draw. For some countries, this is a clear cut, it's already there. Uh, but for some, that uh, probably we can say, and your report reflects it perfectly, uh, might probably suffer the most from the consequences of the climate change. Um, we're not really there. Um, where are the technologies? holds the keys, if you like. But what we see from or in our alliance uh, is the private sector, the giants, the technological giants. This is where technology is. The technology is proprietary. Uh, most of the times it's behind the, the hired curve. We might say that platforms like these and discussions like these should encourage the private sector to be more active and uh, to um, demonstrate the corporate social responsibility in some way, to share these technologies to help those who have not, in order for them to be closer to those who have, therefore bridging the gap. So these three points will be our, our take to your excellent report. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alexia. You pointed to some equity issues here, I think, about sharing and, and gaps can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, yes, uh, equity of the wind is all of the solutions that we're looking at at the Earth Fund, like I mentioned. And in this recent workshop that we held, we deep dive on eight spotlight areas at the intersection of the nexus of where AI has the capabilities and the nature and kind of challenges that we're facing on the planet. And one of the areas that was very interesting that many people wanted to work on in the workshop was this concept of advancing climate justice and the decolonization of data. And that was very much thinking about how do we start to integrate indigenous knowledge and lived experience in you know, the, the, the data sets and, and this realm of knowledge that we're using uh, to advance solutions. And so I, I just wanted to put that forward as a very interesting area for further exploration. And of course that comes with risks, making sure that we're not um, exploiting that knowledge, making sure that it's a team effort uh, and an ecosystem that comes together and it's not just exploiting communities, uh, but making sure that the, the data and then the solutions are really there for everyone. So thanks for that opportunity.
Uh, thank you. And I'll just add to that because I think one topic we haven't mentioned yet is the language translation capabilities that we now have with machine learning tools. And this has been very important in my work. I do a lot of work with Chinese language uh, materials. And Ten years ago, I used to hire Chinese graduate students to help me with Chinese language materials. Uh, five years ago, five years ago, uh, five years ago, if there was a document, a Chinese language document that was in HTML format, Chrome would translate it. But when native Mandarin speakers read it, they correct it a lot. Today, I can upload a hundred-page PDF document into Google Translate in Mandarin, and a second later, it gives me an English-language version, which native Mandarin speakers read, and they say, no, that really doesn't require any corrections. It looks pretty good, it looks pretty good. I think that type of language translation tool is changing the world in many ways, and it's going to have a lot of great potential in climate change mitigation. I think it's going to expose global literature, uh, you know, carbon climate mitigation issues for people who wouldn't have access to it, um, and help to promote indigenous knowledge, making it clear the world Just to, just yeah. to double down on that, I think, uh, yes, we're talking about Mandarin, it's time for us to be looking at the indigenous languages, uh, and effort and funding and, and people, so we got uh, Antoine, how is this working in, in the satellite area? One example that, that comes to my mind is uh, that uh, AI, uh, by enabling us to measure uh, uh, forestry uh, accurately, can really help uh, channel financial flows from uh, developed countries, high emitting countries with a uh, uh, large carbon footprint to the developing countries in the south uh, that have forestry endowments and, and need to be compensated for maintaining that forestry endowment and even increasing it. So uh, uh, that's really the condition. I mean, you, you need to have verification, you need to have very strong measurements in order to create the trust and to create the, the, the channels to bring that money flowing from the north to the south. And AI has a key role to play in that sense. Well, you've done so much work in this area and just had a chance to speak briefly in the main presentation. What are you most excited about in this area? What do you think has the most potential? What do we need to do to realize that potential? Thank you, David. Uh, let me start by saying uh, I've spent most of my career working on the hard to abate stuff. I'm very excited about what AI can do in the hard to abate stuff. Um, and some of that is, again, just measurement and observation and having better data. But then some of that is the efficiency deliveries that we can get in manufacturing, in shipping and aviation and all these sorts of things. And then finally, again, the ability to bring new solutions into those areas with greater performance and fidelity. We're just beginning to see uh, how those things will come forward. Uh, this makes me want to say something that I think is we haven't said yet, but I think it bears some uh, importance. Uh, in this context, AI is the scalpel, but it is not the surgeon. AI is the backhoe and the truck and the crane, but it is not the architect. <laughs> we still need to make sure that we are using these tools in a way that deliver the outcomes that we want. And in that regard, um, I am extremely excited about these novel applications, and the hard to abate sector is not hard to abate. Like, we need everything we can get. But we really need to make sure that we're focused on the performance on, from a carbon and climate perspective in order to maximize those benefits. And many people here know this, but Dr. Friedman is a leading global expert on many topics, but in particular carbon removal and carbon capture. What role do you see AI playing in carbon capture and carbon removal? So let's speak about, uh, uh, for carbon capture, these novel materials are the first and foremost thing. Already that has happened. Uh, there's libraries now of about 60,000 metal organic frameworks. One of those is gonna be useful. <laughs> so that will really reduce the energy. Right now we use about six times more energy than we need to to do these gas separations. That will dramatically reduce the cost of carbon capture. For carbon removal, remember carbon removal is not one thing, it's a dozen things that includes forestry and trees. And so being able to identify and quantify these things better, to identify bad actors, to intervene more quickly, that will be important. Uh, uh, but similarly, for things like biomass based systems, whether it's biochar or bikers, one of our reports, 
or bioenergy with CCS, uh, being able to track sustainable biomass, being able to validate its origin is something that will be very important with AI. Uh, I could spend the rest of this topic discussion these things, but back to you, David. That's an entire report, which I think we have a lot to work on. Let me turn to each of you and, and you each in, in large organizations and just wonder, from your standpoint, what would make the most difference? If you could just make some things happen and make sure that AI really is impacted, emissions, reducing the what do you think? Thanks a lot for the question. Of course, I, I'm not an expert in artificial intelligence. I come from an energy person, so coming from, uh, let's say, climate change, uh, decarbonization of energy system. And according to IRENA's World Energy Transition Outlook, which is our flagship report, basically giving guidance to our member countries of what needs to happen on the renewable energy space to decarbonize the, the energy systems and also the new sectors. And let's say according to our outlook, we will see that electrification has to increase from currently globally 22% as an energy carrier to something like 15 plus percent. So that means electrification becomes a lot more important. And let's say now uh, there is huge importance to build up the infrastructure to organize these flows of electrons. And let's say on top of the investments needed in direct electrification, renewable energy generation to switch from fossil fuels, nuclear to renewables, you have to build up an infrastructure, a tremendous infrastructure this is able, that is able to deal with this electron infrastructure. And I think artificial intelligence and innovation in artificial intelligence can tremendously help to reduce the costs in not just building up now new transmission lines, new distribution lines, but to manage the electrons, let's say, in parallel with the bits and, and finding smart ways in managing the data to, um, let's say, be, be smart and to reduce the investments needed for this infrastructure building. Thank you. Hey, to, to supplement that, which is a great answer, I think that very tactically, we have we have silo ecosystems. We have a set of AI experts that don't speak the nature and climate language. We have a set of nature and climate folks working on the solutions every day that don't speak the AI language. And so bringing those groups together, doing some education of sorts, and actually creating a new cohort, a workforce that speaks both languages, the translators as well. Um, and then of course catalyzing, uh, catalyzing the integration of AI into the solution space. Thinking about what are these great challenges that you all in your report have honestly started to identify um, and, and, and catalyzing people to come together to create the solutions in those spaces. So that's what I'm talking about. Uh, thank you, Noel. Uh, Alexa, any thoughts? Look, what we see, again, from our work, uh, in terms of where the artificial intelligence would uh, demonstrate the most potential, unravel the most potential, uh, in terms of the mitigation of climate change. First of all, AI for uh, predictive analytics in renewable energy, solar and wind. And the uh, headquarters of Eurido is located in Vienna, Austria. Uh, the government has uh, this initiative of uh, inviting citizens to install solar panels on the balconies. Uh, the unit is a flat the household. Uh, electricity is generated and then here's the decision uh, where to consume it this energy and when to give it back to the grid. And here another variable um, says its word. Yes, the weather, the whether or not it's windy, whether or not in this particular uh, in this particular instance is the solar, solar energy. Another variable that artificial intelligence should deal with, should account for, is the price of course. Yes, the highest price is late afternoon. 
when it, the industry starts still running and people just came from home and the uh, lowest price is at night. Uh, so, when do you generate? When do you store? When do you share? Those variables can be all accounted for and managed by artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is here to assist us in prediction of this multivariate um, uh, uh, multivariate, uh, if you like, multivariate regression, yes, but the models itself, themselves, they can be quite uh, complex and artificial intelligence can do that. This is number one. Number two, the, as it was important and excellent in your report, the materials, uh, the new advanced materials, materials for batteries, uh, materials that uh, will yet to come, if you like, and say it's worth it in terms of to help with the carbon capture uh, simulation uh, in the development of those materials. This is where artificial intelligence uh, might help. And the third one, of course, coming back to the uh, energy, is management of the grid and the initiative that was quoted again in the report or quoted again in the report uh, is vehicle to grid model uh, we can use the excess capacity of the batteries of our vehicles to store energy and then when it's needed to share it into the grid again by following the uh, same logic um, we generate uh, when we can generate it uh, to the best of it for it to become worthwhile and we share when we have the excess capacity into the grid. So I'd say three, yes, the artificial intelligence for predictive analytics for renewable energy, artificial intelligence for uh, development of advanced materials for batteries and carbon capture, and artificial intelligence for managing the grid and integrating the grid as one of the examples of the to be model. Thank you. Followed very briefly on that, uh, AI is very, very good at optimizing things. That can optimize renewable input to the grid, grid function, uh, air travel, all of these kinds of things. But again, you need to make sure that you're optimizing for many things, not necessarily just greenhouse gas emissions, but perhaps also cost, perhaps also human health, perhaps also well-being. And this is why, again, these policy issues are so important in the consideration. Uh, uh, thank you, and amen. I agree strongly, and that's a point we make in the report, as you'll see when you read it. Um, we're down to our last couple of minutes. Let me just turn to Andrew for any final thoughts. We'll really have any final thoughts, and then we'll wrap up. Well, just listening to uh, this conversation and the, the many comments uh, made by everyone, I think it's easy to become optimistic about climate change when you think about the role of AI. Uh, there's so many opportunities to uh, improve our climate action to drive decarbonization. Um, perhaps we should also think about what could go wrong with AI, uh, what could be the unintended consequences. Um, and in, in the space that I uh, work on, particularly in this, uh, in, in this report, uh, emissions measurements, uh, there are some issues that could come up. And uh, for example, uh, more and more uh, uh, people are going to be looking at uh, Reducing emission measurements, and there's going to be uh, a risk of uh, contradictory uh, measurements and quality issues, and therefore harmonization and consolidation. Uh, at the same time, uh, having a single source might not be the answer. You need multiple measurements, you need duplication, you need verification. So, there are some issues of, 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 uh, of management, uh, managing AI that might come up in the process, but overall, I think it's extremely, extremely inspiring and, and exciting. Oh yeah, we got about 60 seconds. Final thoughts? Yeah, uh, I want to build on Antoine's uh, point about optimism. Uh, when you see the power and the opportunity that AI can provide in the climate and energy arena, uh, you leave with optimism. It is an engine for innovation, it is an engine for imagination. We are often trapped in the bias that what we see today is the only thing that we will have in the future. That is simply not true. 
and I see uh, AI as a booster rocket that will get us farther and faster in everything that we seek to do in the climate challenge, if we pay attention. Great way to end. Well, let me just close by, by thanking Mehdi again, thanking Nito again, thanking ISAF, thanking our chair in ISAF, Mbuo Tanaka, for his leadership of this process. And thank all of you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, all. Uh, very good, uh, very hot discussion. So we got a lot of views from different aspects of AI. Uh, it was very meaningful discussion. Then uh, all programs of this seminar that ended. At the end, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to all the participants, uh, especially speakers and panelists in this area. Thank you very much. And then I look forward to meeting with you at the next year's event uh, seminar or ISEF meeting in Tokyo or another medals or METIS activities again. Thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you. We also provide uh, so, uh, please enjoy. Thank you. Uh, this is wonderful. Can we have this? Uh, the original? Uh,